Hi there. So in this video, we're going to talk about receptor tyrosine kinases and the role they play in human cancers. So we talked about in a previous video, the regulation of receptor tyrosine kinases, their structure, their function, and how that they bind ligand growth factors. And when they bind ligand, they can dimerize strongly, uh, which activates their kinase domain. And then you have transphosphorylation. So the tyrosines in the tails become phosphorylated, and that sends a signal into the cell to get the cell to go from G1 to S phase. Most human cancers have a mutation in at least one growth factor receptor slash receptor tyrosine kinase, or something that regulates them. So we're gonna see some examples in this video here. The first example of a mutation we're gonna talk about are gene amplifications. Now, we covered mutations in a previous lecture, video, and reading, and if you recall, amplifications of a gene lead to overexpression of, of a protein, and we'll see an example of that here. So let's look at a cell, a normal human cell, that, has, that expresses the EGFR. Um, now, EGFR is uh, a gene that is present on chromosome 7. You should have two copies of chromosome 7, maternal and paternal, and therefore two copies of the EGFR gene. Uh, and express a certain level of the protein. And that is a normal cell, that's great. It is possible that this gene during uh, abnormal DNA replication becomes amplified. So something happens that leads to the DNA polymerase copying this gene multiple times during uh, S phase. And so now, instead of having the normal number of copies of the gene, you have uh, more copies of the gene. The gene has become amplified. Mutations occur like this, amplification. What's the result of ampl gene amplification? Well, very often it is overexpression of the gene, which leads to overexpression or abnormally high levels of the protein. So now you can see I drew in this uh, cell here many copies of the EGFR protein, right? There should be very few copies, but now there are many copies because there are many copies of the gene. Now, you'll notice that I've drawn something different inside the cell. I've drawn tyrosines that are phosphorylated on those tails. Why are they phosphorylated? Do you see any ligand binding? I don't see any ligand binding. But these receptors um, encounter one another with such high frequency that it is possible that they are phosphorylating one another uh, at a very low level, but uh, since they encounter each other at a very high frequency, that they end up producing ligand-independent phosphorylation. And that's what can be occurring when you have abnormally high levels of the receptor. Receptors should be at a very low level, and they should encounter each other very rarely, and only bind and transphosphorylate when ligand is present. In cells where uh, you have overexpression of the growth factor receptor, these receptors are uh, going to encounter each other at a much higher rate, and so they can trigger uh, at a very low level, phosphorylation of one another enough to get the cell to go from G1 to S phase. So this is known as ligand-independent activation. And this is seen in a number of human cancers, uh, some colon cancers, some lung cancers, some uterine, some breast cancers. The gene for a receptor tyrosine kinase is amplified, and the high level of the protein is triggering uh, ligand-independent activation. So this uh, example I showed you here was for EGFR, but there are other human cancers that are driven by amplifications of FGFR or PDGFR or VEGFR. Having too many growth factor receptors on the surface of the cell can trigger uh, the activation of that receptor abnormally, leading the cell to go from G1 to S phase. So that is one example that is very common in human cancers, amplification of uh, receptor tyrosine kinase genes. Second example um, are point mutations in the genes that code for receptor tyrosine kinases. So here, this cell has a normal number of copies of EGFR, makes normal protein. And um, I'm going to draw in some amino acids now. So obviously, proteins are made of amino acids. I'm not drawing them all on my cartoons. But I will draw a leucine that is present at uh, amino acid position 858 uh, in uh, EGFR. So leucine is the normal uh, residue. So it is coded for by the codon CTC in the EGFR gene. 
Um, and if you remember when we talked about mutations in a previous video, how we talked about the nomenclature of mutations. So usually it's like the normal amino acid and then a number. And then if there's a mutation, it's the new amino acid that appears here. But this here is a normal cell. It has CTC uh, codon that codes for uh, leucine at position 858. And that leucine is within the kinase domain. Well, there are some mutations that occur in EGFR that are point mutations. Uh, and here's an example of one. That T in the, the middle of the codon is mutated to a G. What does that do? Well, I could have you pause the video now. Maybe that's a good idea. Go look on your codon table, your genetic code table, and see what amino acid that codes for and how different is that amino acid to leucine. So you want to pause and do that. Maybe you're back. Um, if you look it up, CGC codes for arginine. So the way we would write this nomenclature is L858R. The mutation leads to a leucine being uh, replaced by an arginine. Now, these two amino acids are very different, right? Leucine hydrophobic, arginine uh, positively charged. Well, shouldn't mutations um, do bad things to proteins? Shouldn't they destroy the function of a protein? Not necessarily. They could destroy the active, the regulation of the protein. So let's see that example here. So in this cell I'm about to draw, uh, this cell is homozygous, no, heterozygous for the mutation. One copy of the gene has the mutation, one copy has the normal uh, CTC. So heterozygous. And you can see the cell makes both the normal version with leucine and the mutant version with arginine. So again, uh, replacing a leucine with an arginine, shouldn't that, and that's in the kinase domain, shouldn't that destroy the kinase activity? Not necessarily. Mutations could just destroy the regulation of enzymes, not the enzymatic function of the enzyme. So here in this instance, I'm going to show you that mutating a leucine to an arginine actually causes the kinase to become overactive. Remember, these uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, their kinase activity increases upon ligand binding and dimerization. Having this positive charge there changes the conformation of the protein such that it is highly active. So in this instance here, do you see a ligand? Is there ligand binding? There's no ligand. So what's happening is ligand independent activation of the mutant receptor. So this mutant receptor with this arginine, when it encounters another receptor, it'll just phosphorylate it. There's no growth factor present. It shouldn't be doing that. But that mutation uh, increases the kinase activity uh, of the RTK. Not decreases, not destroys it. It's an activating mutation. And so uh, this is an example in many lung cancers, especially non-small cell lung cancers. Um, and there are other examples, not just in EGFR, um, of mutations, point mutations, that increase the activity of receptor tyrosine kinases. They increase their kinase activity. And so that they're constantly phosphorylating their partners, even though there's no ligand present, and you're getting the cell thinking, time to go into S phase. Third example, small deletions in receptor tyrosine kinase genes. So again, deletions sound like something that would destroy the function of a protein. Well, no, deletions could just destroy the proper regulation of the protein. So again, uh, let's talk about EGFR as an example. There are some human cancers where mm -hmm. the five prime end of the reading frame for EGFR is deleted. Now again, you think a deletion should just destroy a protein. Not necessarily. Um, this deletion uh, removes the coding part of the protein that codes for the extracellular or ectodomain. So what you see there is a headless uh, re uh, receptor. Now you would think, well, this thing shouldn't work. Well, it doesn't work properly. So when this receptor, this headless receptor that's missing the ectodomain, when it encounters um, another receptor, it'll phosphorylate. Why? Because that 3D structure, um, that 3D structure of the protein is now in a conformation that activates it. So even though there's this huge chunk of the protein missing, the 3D structure of the um, truncated EGFR, the kinase still works. In fact, it works at a high level. So when it's running into its ligand, its uh, partner, it'll phosphorylate its partner, even though there's no ligand. 
Uh, this other example I'm, I was going to write at the bottom was another deletion actually in the Kinase domain. Uh, and again, you would think, wait a minute, if the Kinase domain has a small deletion in it, shouldn't it abolish the Kinase activity? Well, not this one. This is a small deletion of a few amino acids that, again, are involved in the regulation of the kinase. Remember, the kinase should have very low activity if there's no ligand and no dimerization. And the kinase activity increases when you have ligand binding, dimerization that changes the 3D structure of the protein. So small deletions here could abolish the regulation of the kinase. So now it is highly active. And so when it encounters a partner, even again in the absence of ligand, then um, you have kinase activity, phosphorylation, and the cell go, thinks it should go from G1 to S. So uh, again, examples of ligand-independent activations, mutations in receptor tyrosine kinases that lead to the receptor phosphorylating its dimer pair. The last one we'll talk about is overexpression of growth factor. So in the previous ones, it was all about mutations in the receptor. It is possible that cells can overproduce growth factor. And then in a tumor, you have cells going through the cell cycle because of an abnormally high level of growth factor. So here's a cell uh, that has EGFR on its surface. And now the cell is overproducing EGF. So now we're actually talking about ligand dependent activation of receptors. So uh, EGF levels should actually be very low and they should only be produced if we need more cells. Well, it is possible that there are mutations in the genes that regulate the production of growth factor so that cells are producing abnormally high levels of growth factor. And if that's the case, then the growth factor is going to bind the growth factor receptor and lead to dimerization, activation of kinase, transphosphorylation, the cell goes from G1 to S. Again, growth factors should not be produced at high levels unless we need more cells. But sometimes mutations lead to high levels of growth factor. Um, in this uh, cartoon here, uh, what kind of signaling is this? Remember we learned different types of signaling, endocrine, paracrine, autocrine, juxtacrine. If I dr I've drawn this cell producing its own growth factor and telling itself to grow, this is an example of autocrine signaling. So there are some human cancers that produce their own growth factor, and that's how they get themselves to go through the cell cycle. There are other human cancers that um, have tricked neighboring cells into producing growth factor. And so if another cell is producing growth factor and is coming back and reaching the tumor cell, that is uh, paracrine signaling. So in some human cancers, there are uh, this overproduction of growth factor either autocrine or paracrine or both, or there's mutations in the receptor. Either way, the end result is the tyrosines within the tail becoming phosphorylated, sending a signal into the cell, telling the cell to go from G1 phase to 